so I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this wonderful workshop. So yes, today I'll speak about um, Donaldson Thomas invariants of local elliptic surfaces. So I should say this is all joint work with Jim Bryan. So I'll start with um, some general comments on um, Hilbert schemes on three folds, since not everyone in this audience might be working with them on a daily basis. So we'll start quite general. So let X be a smooth threefold over the complex numbers. <coughs> and we'll denote by beta a two cycle on X. And chi will be some integer. Then the moduli space we'll be considering in this uh, talk is the Hilbert scheme. curves on X in class beta and with Euler characteristic chi. So what is this? Let me spell it out. So these are um, closed subschemes Z in X. Of dimension less than or equal to 1. by which I mean Z is allowed to have zero-dimensional components as well as one-dimensional components. So I'm not insisting on X to have to be uh, projective, so I'm assuming here that Z is from support. Okay, yeah. And um, we'll also be fixing some invariance here, so we want the algebraic cycle determined by Z to be beta and the holomorphic Euler characteristic of the ring of functions to be this fixed number chi. So it's the space of all one-dimensional subschemes in X with this data. Um, the Hilbert scheme So since not everyone may be working with these very often, let's treat an example. So example, suppose the simplest threefold, x is just affine three space, um, then giving a closed subscheme of x is the same as specifying the equations which define um, the subscheme. In other words, specifying Z in X is the same thing as specifying the ideal of equations defining X, defining Z. So I'm using here global coordinates, X, Y, and Z on affine space. So here's a picture of a one-dimensional closed subscheme. So here the ideal we're having is the ideal generated by um, X, Y squared xz, yz, and z squared. So what I'm drawing here is the weight spaces of the structure sheaf of Z in the character letters. So this guy here has um, these four generators. So there's one infinite leg extending in this direction, another one here. So this one has a multiplicity too. And then here we see something special. This curve here has an embedded point. So what this means is if we look at the ideal of this point, Z, inside the ring of functions on Z, then the interesting thing is that this ideal is zero-dimensional, whereas this object here is one-dimensional. And if you take the co-kernel here, you get exactly the structure sheaf of the curve which is drawn here. So this is the curve Z, and this is the curve C. And so we see here that we have removed the embedded point. So in mathematical terminology, we say that Z is not Cohen-Macaulay. <coughs> 
which means its structure sheaf is not pure one-dimensional. So which means intuitively that um, Z may have embedded points or floating points. Um, but C, on the other hand, is Colin Macaulay. And we will, will refer to C as the maximal cone macaulay subcurve of Z. So C in Z is the maximal subcurve with no embedded points or zero-dimensional components. How you, de how you determine this? Well, in practice, that could be quite hard, in fact. Um, but we'll be mostly, at some point in this talk, be considering uh, the ones which are fixed by the torus action, like the ones I drew here, and there it's a bit easier. Um, so yeah, note incidentally that there is an obvious action of the three torus on this geometry, just the standard action. And actually the examples I've given here are all fixed or invariant under this action. So these are both um, T invariant. So I'm only giving you T invariant examples here because they'll come back later. Okay, so this is some uh, general setup. So now let's specialize to the geometry we'll consider today. So today, we'll momentarily go to a surface. So S over some base B is an elliptic surface. Where um, we assume two things. We assume, first of all, that the surface has a section. So with section B in S. The section will denote by B as well. And we only assume the simplest type of singularities of the Kodaira classification. So with only rational nodal singular fibers. So a little topological computation then shows that the number of these is exactly the topological Euler characteristic of your surface, and we'll assume there's at least one singular fiber. So the picture of this guy is um, as follows. We've got our surface here with a section. The generic fiber is a smooth elliptic curve, and then there's a finite number of these rational nodal fibers, and this maps down to some base B. So this is the picture. But then we want to do threefold theory. So the x, the threefold x we'll be considering is the simplest Calabi-Yau threefold you can construct out of this geometry. It's the total space of the canonical bundle over this surface. Actually, Calabi-Yau won't play a role in any of what I'm going to do in this talk. So, um, so what we'll do is we'll study Hilbert schemes on here. So what is the curve class we look at? So the curve class is we always take one time the section and then a multiple of the fiber class. So here we see the class of the section. Here the class of the fiber. So all the fibers have the same class. So this is the class we'll be considering. And what we'll do is we'll look at the simplest invariant you can attach to, um, to this Hilbert scheme will just take the topological Euler characteristic. So we'll consider the topological Euler characteristic of Hilbert schemes on this x in this class, section plus a multiple of the fiber. So this here is just ordinary topological Euler characteristic. And we'll group these all together in a generating series, summing both over multiples of the fiber, D, and over holomorphic Euler characteristic, 
using a variable p and q, q for the fiber. And we'll call this generating series dt hat of x. So this is the main object of study. And we'll also study another dt hat fibra uh, fiber x, which is the same thing, except that we take as our curve class um, not b plus a multiple of the section of the fiber, but just only multiples of the fiber. So the same generating function, but only multiples of the fiber. So the reason this is written as dt hat is because these are related to um, so-called Donaldson-Thomas invariants. Um, so if I remove the hat, I'll actually be talking about actual Donaldson-Thomas invariants. So most of the talk, or almost the entire talk, I'll talk about these naive dt invariants. But how do you get the actual Donaldson-Thomas invariants? So you do the same. So again, this generating series. But instead of the naive Euler characteristic, you weigh by a constructible function known as Behrens constructible function. So this is some constructible function which keeps track of the scheme structure of your Hilbert scheme. And if you happen to include it, you get the actual Donaldson-Thomas invariants. But again, I'll be talking mostly about these. And then, of course, there's a fiber version of this as well. So what is the main theorem I want to talk about? So um, maybe one more piece of notation. For the theorem, I'll use two modular forms. I'll use um, Dedekind's eta function. And the Jacobi theta function. So what is the main theorem? The main theorem is that um, this generating series dt of x, well, let's uh, look at the hat version, after dividing out by the fiber part, is just given by, well, after eliminating this front factor, eta to the power minus the Euler characteristic of the surface, and then theta minus the Euler characteristic of the base. And the second part of the theorem, which I won't talk about, is assuming a conjecture on the Bairn function. Conjecture star, if there's time I say something about it. Um, we can get a formula for the actual Donaldson-Thomas invariance. So geometrically, dividing by this fiber, by this fiber generating series means you take the connected Donaldson-Thomas invariance, which are only defined formally. Um, and it turns out if you include this Behrendt function, you get the same formula up to some signs. You get a sign in front times the same formula, where you have to make one replacement. You have to replace p by minus p. So in this talk, I'll be talking about um, this first item only. 
So I should say a few things. In some sense, the interesting part perhaps of this theorem is not the formula itself, but rather the way we derive this. So what we do is I'm actually going to present to you a method of reducing this expression here purely to an expression in terms of the topological vertex, so to something purely combinatorial. And then that combinatorial expression can be um, written in this form. So this may be a bit surprising because the geometry here is not toric. So you'll see how I'll nevertheless force in um, some toric geometry here. So in the case of a K3 surface, if you like, this gives a new um, way of getting to the katz klem vava formula, which was first derived in primitive classes by um, so S is K3. So the first proof in mathematics of the katz klem vava formula was given by Maulik, Panri, Panda, Thomas. In a primitive case, note, since I'm not taking a multiple of the section, I'll only talk about the primitive case as well. And then um, the general proof KKV was given not so long ago in a monumental paper by Panripan and Thomas. So this is all curve classes. So what's interesting is that both of these um, proofs make use of the so-called Kawai-Yoshioka formula, um, and we won't be using that. So this will be purely a calculation with the topological vertex. I should also mention another thing. The methods I'll talk about today are also quite effective in other geometries, other geometries, um, other three folds with an elliptic vibration. So there have already been applications to um, X is K3 times an elliptic curve by Jim Bryan, and X is the product of three elliptic curves by um, Bryan, Oberdijk, Pandri Pande, and Yin. Okay, so I'll talk now about how to get to this formula. So actually, the only moves I'll be making are the most, naive move, the most naive moves you can make with a topological Euler characteristic, namely the following. So the topological Euler characteristic E of a space, or of a scheme, if you like, has the following properties. The cut-paste property, if you have a closed subscheme of another scheme, then the Euler characteristic of X is just, um, let's say the Euler characteristic of X remove Z, is just the Euler characteristic of X minus the Euler characteristic of Z. The second property I'll be using is if you have two schemes of varieties, the Euler characteristic of the product is the product of the Euler characteristics. I'll also be using that if you happen to have a C-star action on X, then the Euler characteristic is just the Euler characteristic of the fixed locus. Um, 
And the final property is that if um, you have a bijective morphism, so a morphism which is bijective, so I'm not insisting on an isomorphism here, then um, their Euler characteristics are also the same. So in particular, if you have a scheme, its Euler characteristic is just the Euler characteristic of the underlying reduced scheme, the underlying reduced variety. So this is all we need. So now let's go to the geometry we're considering. So we're having here, um, so what are we having? We're having x, the total space of the canonical bundle over this elliptic surface. So this has an obvious C star action, namely scaling of the fibers of the vector bundle, of this line bundle. So this action lifts to the moduli space. the Hilbert scheme. So here I'll write a bullet by which I mean I actually group them all together. So the curve class is fixed, but I'm just taking the union over all possible holomorphic Euler characteristics. So I'm grouping them all together just for brevity of notation. Okay, so we have this torus action. So what we do now is we take an element in here, some subscheme. And we assume it's torus fixed. So remember, we only have to calculate the Euler characteristic of the fixed locus by this property here. So let's see what these subschemes look like. So suppose we have a one dimensional curve here, a one dimensional subscheme which is C star fixed. So what can we say about it? So the first obvious thing is that the underlying reduced curve has to lie in the zero section of your vector bundle. Um, now comes the important one. So what can we say? So if we look at the ideal, which is defining Z, this ideal has a C star action, which means it decomposes into weight spaces. So we have a decomposition into weight spaces. And the summons of this decomposition have a specific form. They are themselves ideal sheaves of schemes on the surface, up to some global twists which you need for gluing. So there is a decomposition like this, where um, these ZIs here appearing at the, f at the different weight levels actually form a nesting. So we have a nesting here of one dimensional schemes. And finally, what we know is the curve class is the section plus a multiple of the fiber. So we know that if we take the sum of all the classes of these ZIs, we have to get our curve class back. So in particular, this sum can only be finite. So this decomposition here only goes up to some level. So you should imagine this as a stack of pancakes, which becomes smaller and smaller. So one, the bottom one has to contain the next one, etc. So this is still quite general, so still quite hard. But it becomes easier if we look at Z without um, embedded points. So now we're going to look at C star fixed curves which are called Macaulay. So let's see, be the maximal cone Macaulay subcurve of Z. So I'm removing all zero dimensional components and all embedded points. So this C actually <coughs> 
can be drawn in a very geometric picture. So I'm now going to draw a picture, which will be the main picture. So imagine the zero section S surface inside our threefold. So here we have the section B. And what does such a C look like? Well, the underlying reduced curve has to be just one time the section and then a bunch of fibers. Let's say fibers above points. So a bunch of smooth fibers, Fx1 up to Fxm. And then a bunch of singular fibers, Fy1. up to Fyn. Okay, this is the underlying reduced curve. So what does the actual Cohen-Macaulay curve look like? So what you do is, because of this nesting property, in the Cohen-Macaulay case, each of these here are just divisors on the surface. So the way you should imagine this is, let's start with this fiber here. You thicken this fiber at weight level zero some direction in the surface. Then at weight level one, you do the same, etc. So what I'm doing here is I'm thickening this fiber here infinitesimally in both the surface direction and the fiber direction according to some partition. Some partition lambda one. And then I thicken the whole curve according to this partition. And the same for all other fibers with possibly some other partitions here. So these partitions are just the cross-sections of what your Cohen-Macaulay curve looks like. So this is the picture of a fixed Cohn-Macaulay curve. And remember, the section only appears with multiplicity one. So here you should think of like a little box. So this is just not thickened at all. So here I'm putting the partition of size one. The thickening is really just the fiber times a small interval? Or um, so the, the thickening is really, yeah, um, in terms of the ideal, if say locally this is defined by some... Um, some x, you just take x to some power l and do that at each level in the surface. So these are all just infinitesimal thickenings, and these are all possible pictures of all maximal Cohn Macaulay subcurves. So the idea now is to just stratify the entire Hilbert scheme according to these pictures. So note, by the way, that the sizes of these partitions all have to sum up to D, the fixed curve class, which I just wiped out. Um, so now the main claim is that if you look at, okay, so let's call, let's give some name to the stratum of all subschemes with underlying fixed Cohn-Macaulay curve. So what have I fixed here? I fixed a bunch of points above which we have smooth fibers, a bunch of points above which we have singular fibers. So this is at most the Euler characteristic of the surface. And then I fixed a number of partitions. So I'll denote by sigma the stratum of all elements in the fixed locus of the Hilbert scheme, where the underlying Cohn-Macaulay curve is that picture. So with underlying maximal Cohn-Macaulay curve determined by the points x, y, and the partitions lambda and mu. Right, so this is the stratum of all one-dimensional schemes where the underlying Cohn-Macaulay curve is this picture. <coughs> 
Um, so now the main claim is that when we fix this data, the Euler characteristic does not depend on the precise location of these points x, i, and y, j. So this is perhaps not so surprising, but that's somehow the main, the main claim. So the Euler characteristic of this stratum So I'm using here abbreviation. This bullet, remember, is I'm summing always over all holomorphic Euler characteristics. So these Euler characteristics only depend on the partitions. So how many there are of each type and what partitions they are. So this only depends lambda and mu. So I'll call this quantity here, since it doesn't depend on x and y, I'll just call it E of lambda and mu. And the form of variable we're having here is P. Yes? Yeah, so this dot here, so the stratum is this stratum, and with the dot I actually mean that I'm taking the union over all possible holomorphic Euler characteristics, chi. So chi, I'm grouping them all together. So the curve class is always fixed, but those I all group together. So what does this imply? Well, since our moduli space is just the union over, over these strata, the disjoint union, you already get some sort of formula for your DT invariant. So you choose any number of smooth fibers, M, and then any number of singular fibers, n. Remember, you can only choose at most Euler characteristic of the surface uh, singular fibers. And then what do you get? So um, then you get a big sum over partitions lambda 1 up to lambda m, mu 1 up to mu n. So I'm summing here over all possible strata sigma that can occur. And then what do you have? So you just have q to the total size of these partitions. The total size of these partitions determines um, the multiple of the fiber times, so this is the number of ways in which we can choose M smooth fibers, so Euler characteristic of the base, minus the number of um, smooth, of singular fibers. So this may be negative, so then I'm using the usual conventions of binomial coefficients. And the number of ways in which we can choose a singular fiber is just Euler characteristic of the surface, choose N. And then the final factor is this, this E here. So I've done nothing really here, just stratify the moduli space into these strata and sum their Euler characteristics up. So the key point now is to prove the claim and find a formula for, this, for the Euler characteristic of such a stratum. Any questions at this stage? Yes, um, which is in here. Yeah. Okay, so let's calculate this. Okay, so I should keep this picture. Okay, so we're now reduced to a stratum of the moduli space where the underlying maximal cone Macaulay curve is this picture. And then we're looking at all possible ways of putting in embedded points and floating points. And we want the Euler characteristic of that. So we are reduced. So fix such a stratum. Sigma 
x, y, lambda mu. So in particular, this fixes um, some CM curve C determined by this data, so the picture you see here. So we now want to calculate the Euler characteristic of this, of this stratum. So the point now is that we're going to use a cover, a cover, an open cover of our threefold. So take an open cover, which I'm going to describe, u alpha of our threefold x. So what are the elements of this open cover? So first of all, so what we're going to do is we're going to take really small balls around all the interesting points in this geometry, which means around all the singularities of the underlying reduced curve. So we take a small ball everywhere where the fiber hits the section, and we take a small ball around the nodes, small open balls around the singularities of the underlying reduced curve. So actually, we're doing algebraic geometry here, so taking small balls is perhaps not the right thing. So really what I'm doing here is, um, for the algebraic geometers, I'm taking a so-called FPQC cover. So, Fidelman Plat, a quasi-compact. And so what it means here, instead of open balls, really what I'm taking is, I'm just looking at the local rings at those points, and I'm taking their completion. I'm just taking spec of the completion of the local ring. So really what this just is, if you choose coordinates, this is spec of the formal power series ring in three variables. So instead of open balls, I'm actually really taking formal neighborhoods around all the interesting singular points of the underlying reduced curve. And here we see where the torus comes in. Because now we have a three-dimensional torus which is acting on here. Just a standard torus action. So that is where the topological vertex will come from. So what else am I going to take? I'm going to take um, tubular neighborhoods of what's left. So I take this curve and I remove all the singularities. So then you get like these open tubular neighborhoods. etc. Also here for the singular fibers. So really, again, I'm just taking formal tubular neighborhoods of this underlying reduced curve after removing the singularities. But I'll just, I just want you to think of it as small analytic open neighborhoods. And then what's left, there's one big Sarisky open left, just the threefold remove the entire underlying curve. So this is the cover. So, so now let's see how we can calculate on this cover. So the point now is that we have a restriction map. So we have our stratum here. And we fix these, this underlying curve. And we've got a restriction map to a bunch of Hilbert schemes on these local pieces of the cover. So I'm just taking some one-dimensional subscheme with this underlying cone Macaulay curve, and I'm looking 
at what it induces on all the pieces of this cover. So now comes the key observation. Since we already fo fixed the underlying cone Macaulay curve, there is no gluing here anymore. So when you do the restriction, you lose no information. The gluing is only determined by how the underlying cone Macaulay curve glues, but that one we fixed already. So by restricting to these open pieces, we already have here a bijective map. Again, the underlying cone Macaulay curve is all that comes in when you glue, because when you look on overlaps of patches, the, um, the embedded points and the floating points are simply not there. So this restriction map is bijective. So to be precise, it's a bijective constructible morphism. It's not actually a morphism, but for Euler characteristic reasons. Uh, this is fine. This means it's a morphism on a certain stratification of sigma. So we're reduced now to just calculating the Euler characteristics on these local pieces. So let's do one example. Let's look at, for example, um, this open neighborhood here. So I'm going to call this point P here. And let's call this partition simply mu. So I'm dropping the superscript. So here we have some open neighborhood U alpha. So let's see what happens on there. So what happens on this open piece? Right, so we're now on this open piece around such a node with a partition mu coming in. So what we want to calculate is the Euler characteristic of this local piece. And as I said, now suddenly we have a full three-dimensional torus. So this is just the Euler characteristic of the full C star cubed fixed locus. But this moduli space has isolated fixed points, which are just parameterized by um, 3D partitions. I'll draw a picture in a minute. So this is just the sum over all 3D partitions, pi, with asymptotics uh, mu, mu, mt, and then pi to the size of p. So let me draw the picture. So the C star cubed fixed elements are just all 3D partitions, which at some point limit to our fixed partition mu. On both sides. And here there's no lag. So the underlying cone Macaulay curve locally just looks like making this come together. And then the way you put in embedded points is you just stack boxes here further on top. So these are the elements we sum over. So this object is very well known in physics. So I should maybe also say what is pi here. So pi is the size of the partition, which is a little tricky for infinite legs because this extends infinitely. So this is what's known as the renormalized volume. So it's um, the sum over all boxes, where if a box appears in more than one leg, you subtract the number of legs it appears in. So this is the well-known 
topological vertex, which you can find in, um, for example, which you can find in Okunkov. Pesetikin, Vafa. So the reason I'm putting here this symbol in front is that the two coincide up to some overall factor of P, which has to do with the way you normalize. So there's some overall factor of P here in front. So now, what have we achieved if we put this all together? Asymptotics? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Does the partition need to have? What does asymptotics mean? Oh, what does the asymptotics mean? Oh, so I just wiped out the picture. So it means, so we fix some partition mu, 2D partition. And in this case, there are two infinite legs. And if you take a cross section of these two infinite legs, it has to be this fixed partition, this fixed 2D partition mu. So that's what it means. So only in a finite box stuff happens, and then outside that box, you just have mu extended and empty extended. I mean, in the paper, a priori, you could put here any lambda mu nu. But for this geometry, this is the most complicated which comes up. And for those working with the topological vertex, if you follow the conventions in here, you have to take, strictly speaking, the transpose partition here. So what do we get now? We get a formula for the Euler characteristic of this stratum. So this also proves that it will be independent. Okay, I think I... The locations of our points. So what is this Euler characteristic? Well, so we just take a product over all the opens in our stratification. So then we, yes, sadly I wiped out this picture, but because of lack of blackboard space I had to. So, um, so I'm now just writing the local contribution for all the small balls where the fiber hits the section. Then there's a local contribution. So where a smooth fiber hits the section, then there's a local contribution where each singular fiber hits the section. And then remember, we also chose a small ball around every singularity of a singular fiber. So this is the total contribution of all the small open balls. But then, of course, there's more. I didn't talk at all about the tubular neighborhoods. So there is a contribution of the tubular neighborhoods and the contribution of the big Savisky open subset, which is the complement of the curve. So this is um, the other contributions of the other opens. But again, it turns out that you can by looking at such a tubular neighborhood and recording the locations of the embedded points, you can use a further stratification to also express those in terms of the topological vertex. So if you put it all together, you get the following final formula for the DT invariant. So I'm taking the formula which I derived earlier, the one where E was still appearing, and then I plug in this formula. And then what do you get? you get some front factor this front factor don't worry about those halves this is always even so those halves disappear and then there are two contributions one from the smooth fibers <coughs> 
to the sum over all possible 2D partitions of um, some factor so let me comment on this so which part have we seen so we've seen this part and all the rest you're seeing here appears from the fiber contribution so this comes from the fiber from the tubular neighborhoods of the fibers and this one here too and this one comes from the tubular neighborhood of the punctured section and then what's the contribution of the and this also comes from the tubular neighborhood of the section and then what's left for the singular fibers is this expression So again, the part we've seen is this part. This part here you don't have to worry. That was I was telling you that the topological vertex and the Euler characteristics of the strata differ up to some overall power of Q of P. That's this power here. Again, this comes from the section. This comes from the punctured fiber. So this is the final formula. And these are purely combinatorial objects. So in principle, you can put this in a computer, and then you'll find numerically that this is the KKV formula for a K3, for example. But to actually prove that takes some work. So it turns out that if you express this one in terms of sure functions, that this one is actually known in the literature. This one appears in a paper by Bloch Okunkov. And it gives rise to a theta function. Now this one turned out to be new, or at least we couldn't find it in the literature. So um, it took us quite a while to, to get this one. So we actually needed a specialist here, namely in joint work with Ben Young. This one um, was expressed, this one was expressed in terms of Um, a trace of an operator on Fox space, the infinite wedge space. So this part was really largely due to Ben Young. He got the main ideas there. And then if you calculate this one, you again see some explicit expression with thetas, and it all combines to the theorem in the beginning. Now, since I see that there are a few minutes left still, yes. Um, oh, in, in actually calculating this one? No, so it turned out um, what you could do here is, so this entire expression turns out to be, you have, you have this infinite wedge space, you write down some operators on there. Because of this mu here, this q to the mu, you can somehow see it's some, there's some natural operator which has this as its expression. And then the way to calculate it is, you play, so once you've written it in this way, so there's a bunch of operators here, let's say A, B, C, and all you, you have to use is the commutation relations between these operators, which are already known in the literature, because most of them are just the ordinary um, vertex operator, and then there's one which has to do with this bloch okunkov operator. So you use two ingredients, the standard commutation relations, and um, the cyclicity of trace. And it turns out that only these two ingredients, by playing them out against each other in a clever way, which was Ben Young, um, you actually find that expression. So there's actually a separate combinatorial paper on this. Um, so maybe in the remaining four minutes, let me only do one thing. Let me just write down for completeness for the geometers, 
I was telling to get the actual Donaldson Thomas invariance, we need a conjecture. So all I'll do is write down this conjecture. The toric case of this conjecture is, is known. So, that's, so let x be any three folds. This time we do want Calabial. And let c be any Cohn Macaulay curve in it. And to be on the safe side, we assume that the only singularities which the underlying reduced curve has locally look like something toric. So either locally there's some smooth curve or um, a node or three coordinate axes coming together. But conceivably there may be more general situations where this holds. Then let's look at a stratum of the Hilbert space, of the entire Hilbert scheme. So we look at Again, as we did here, so we look at all subschemes where the underlying Cohn Macaulay curve is our fixed curve. So this lies inside the entire Hilbert scheme. Okay, I'm suppressing here that we also have some curve class. Maybe I should put that in. And then what is the conjecture? So then, <coughs> so then, um, the Behrendt function We want to be on the safe side again, so we integrate the Behrendt function over this stratum. So this is the Behrendt function of the entire Hilbert scheme on the threefold. And the claim is that this is just the Hilbert scheme, the Behrendt function at the underlying cone Macaulay curve times minus one to the number of embedded points times the actual Euler characteristic of the stratum. So you could even conjecture something more refined. You could even say the Behrendt function at Z, where Z lies in here, is nothing but the Behrendt function of the underlying cone Macaulay curve times minus one to the n. That would be an even stronger thing to conjecture. And the final thing the, which we can do, actually, is this part we can compute. So this gives rise to this, this front factor. So this actually, calculating the Behrendt function at these curves, turns out to be quite delicate. Unexpectedly, these curves actually turn out to be smooth points of your Hilbert scheme. And it leads to this, to this particular sign. But we can't, this is all we can do. And of course, I mean, you can list some evidence for this. Re irreducible curve classes, this appears in work of Pandri Panda Thomas. The toric case, this is known. Um, perhaps in the stable pairs case, more is known. But um, yeah, for us it's just we conjecture this and then we get the formula. Okay, that was it.